So we're going to talk about some whitefly IPM programs and some different crops. I'm going to move, oops. So um, basically in Canada, we have two main species. Although theoretically, sometimes we see banded wing whitefly, it's pretty rare. So we're really talking about the white whitefly, which is actually um, uh, two different species. I mean, there's lots of names that float around with whitefly. So you'll hear silverleaf whitefly, sweet potato whitefly. Well, the newest data in on, in on that is um, what we used to think of as Bamesia B biotype and Bamesia Q biotype are actually two completely different species. And so one is now named Meme 1 and the other one is Med which I find confusing. I don't think anyone's ever going to get used to Bamesia meme and Bamesia med. So I'm just going to stick with Bamesia B and Q, but understand they are different species, not just biotypes. Um, we also have greenhouse whitefly, obviously. So the difference between Bamesia and whichever species you're talking about and greenhouse whitefly um, is that greenhouse whitefly um, uh, does exist outside in Canada. It comes in through the vents. It's got lots of different plant hosts. Um, we have very effective biocontrol for it and we have very effective insecticides for it. Bamesia, on the other hand, doesn't overwinter outdoors in Ontario. It comes strictly in on cuttings or other plant material. Um, so not just poinsettias, but like hibiscus and mandevilla and other tropicals. And it is the predominant um, white fly and predominant pest on poinsettia crops in Ontario. So sometimes growers will say they've got greenhouse white fly on their poinsettia and that theoretically could have come from somewhere else in their greenhouse, but by the time you've got poinsettia in the cooler months, it's greenhouse white fly isn't coming in from outside, it's too cold, so. So here's our different white fly stages. Um, the eggs are sort of this beigey color and they turn darker as they get older and they're laid on the underside of the leaf and white flies seem to prefer new plant material so if you're looking for eggs look at the new growth um, they are difficult to see you can see them with a hand, hand lens but they are pretty difficult so um, generally when i'm scouting or doing uh, research with white fly I tend to just not count the eggs <laughs> unless I can rip off plant parts and use the microscope. So what you're really looking for is the nymphs, which can be pretty flat. There's four stages. Um, they're sort of scale-like, but you can sort of, um, as they get older, they get more raised and they take about two weeks to develop. And it's important to note that everything but the first stage, the N1, is immobile. So basically the egg hatches, the little nymph runs out it can't go very far so it maybe goes a little bit down the leaf and then it sticks where it is it puts its mouth parts in and it doesn't move again until it hatches out as an adult so the pupae they become thick and raised and opaque so they look a bit more like insects you can actually start to see their eye spots develop and the important thing about pupae is they're really the key identification stage for white fly um, it can be hard when you're just looking at these little flat suckers to figure out who's who, but the pupae are much more obvious. And I'll show you that in a second. So species identification. So greenhouse white fly. Adults hold their wings flat and they sort of appear heart-shaped when viewed from above. Adults can have cream colored bodies. Um, and then the next characteristic you wanna look for for greenhouse white fly is the hairs. So the fourth instar nymphs, as they become closer to pupae, they get these really long hairs on them. So you can see this here in the pupae. Um, the pupae are generally white in color and they have rounded edges. So they look round from above and uh, rounded edges when straight sides, when viewed from the side. So I always think of them as a birthday cake with candles because they're just such a perfect, uh, cylinder, I guess is the right word, like cut off cylinder with hairs on it. Bamesia, on the other hand, the adults hold their wings at their sides and they appear rectangular when viewed from above rather than heart shaped. They have more yellow bodies than the cream bodies as adults. Um, the nymphs and pupae are hairless, so that's a big difference between the two. And the pupae are more yellow than white. 
And they've got this sort of an sesame seed shape, but they're sort of like a pinched in sesame seed, like somebody went boop, kind of right near the top. Sorry, as I crunch my cup, Penny. So when we talk about pesticides for whitefly, the story is really, really different depending on what species you're talking about. So for greenhouse whitefly, these are the products we currently have registered, although some of them we may be losing. <laughs> um, but they all work pretty well. Um, Bamesia B, which is the meme one species, it can be a real crapshoot. So that's why I've put a question mark next to all of these products. I think it's a fallacy that um, I think a lot of growers believe that it's just the Q type, Bamesia med, that is highly, highly resistant to chemicals. It's true that it's more resistant, but the Bamesia B has always been able to develop a lot of resistance as well. So I have had growers, um, so an important thing to know about the Bamesia species is you can't tell them apart visually, you can only tell them apart with genetic analysis. So I've often had growers have like a huge Bamesia problem that they couldn't control with pesticides. So they're convinced it's Q. So we send off like a representational sample and we get back that it's 100% B. Um, and that meant they had complete resistance to all of these products in their B population. So it is a bit of an like academic exercise to try to figure out like if you have B versus Q because both of them can be really, really resistant. And the only real difference is if it's Q, like we're definitely probably not gonna beat it back with pesticides. So um, like I just said, Bamesia whitefly efficacy is constantly changing because it really depends on the population genetics of your whitefly, where they came from, um, uh, like which, what production facility, what their management practices were there to see, to know what they are going to be susceptible to and what they're not going to be able to. And that's true for B and Q. So for us, especially when it comes to Bamesia, but um, also true for greenhouse whitefly because they're easy to control with biocontrol. The answer is really biocontrol for whitefly. Uh, we've got a bunch of different super cute um, biocontrol agents for this one. So this little ladybug thing, Delphastis, and Carcia, which is a parasitoid, uh, Swirskii, which we've talked about before, and Aramoceros, which is another parasitoid. So the secret to good white fly biocontrol is really attacking multiple life stages at once. So we've got the eggs, nymphs, pupae, adults, and knowing what to apply for which stage. Um, so for um, the eggs, we've got predatory mites. So Swirskii will eat white fly eggs and Delphastis, um, it's an egg predator. So it mainly eats um, the eggs. So for the nymphs, we've got parasitoids, um, mites again, uh, Swirskii will feed on the first sort of nymphs that are mobile. Uh, beetles, again, Delphastis will feed on the nymphs as well. And we've got entomopathogenic fungi. Um, so Bavaria and MET52 can both have some effect against whitefly. And then for the pupae, again, the predatory beetles are feeding on these, which is great. We've got fungi. And both of um, the parasitoids also do host feeding, um, which is, so they don't just parasitize um, the nymphs. They also will break them open and use them for nutrients as well. And then on the pesticide front, we can attack the nymphs with systemic or translaminar pesticides, and, as well as dips. Um, the reason I don't have contact on here um, is because it's, especially with something like poinsettia, it's really difficult to get um, products in the right place to kill the nymphs because they're just so flat against the leaf and on that underside that if you can use a systemic or translaminar product, um, that's far superior. And then for the adults, Theoretically, we have fogs and systemic um, uh, pesticides, but those don't always work and they tend to be slow against the adults, the systemic pesticides anyway. So the adults do feed, but um, not in the same way like something like an aphid does, so that can take a while. But the interesting thing is that we, when it comes to biocontrol agents, we actually can attack more life stages with bios than we can with um, pesticides. So the pesticides 
really don't have any effect on the egg stage or the pupal stage, mostly because they're non-feeding phases. Um, so that's a point towards biocontrol for these insects as well. So like Mike was talking about with the aphids, um, we really need to pick the right biocontrol agent for the right pest. Uh, but again, there's some fallacies that are sort of going on here. So um, in Carcia formosa, for a long time, I've heard from a lot of different people that that's the one you should pick for greenhouse whitefly. That is true, but it also does work pretty much equally as well against Bamesia. And so some evidence here is some pictures that I took. This is um, uh, Bamesia pupae parasitized by uh, Encarcia, and um, this is uh, Bamesia parasitized by Aramoceros. So it can do both. Um, the flip side is not true though. Um, Aramosteris will do a little bit of host feeding on greenhouse whitefly, but it tends not to parasitize it. So you want to use it for Bamesia. We used to have Aramosteris mundus, but it looks like it's not produced anymore. Um, but we do have predators. So the check boxes here are a little less bolded just because they're less effective. So it's, it's really the parasitoids that are the backbone of your whitefly biocontrol program. And think of these like supporting players, Delphastis, We've got um, Lamonicus, which is the newest mite on the market. I mean, new being 2011. And then we've got Swirskii. So just a, a bit about each of these biocontrol agents. So Encarcia, um, its optimal temperature is around 24 degrees and it needs really high light levels. Uh, it parasitizes and host feeds on whitefly nymphs. It also host feeds on pupae whereas Aramoceros does not do that. So that's another reason why Bamesia, or Bamesia, why Encarcia is good in a, a Bamesia whitefly program is because you're able to attack another life stage even if you're just using um, parasitoids. Uh, on the negative side, it does have lowered oviposition and reduced host feeding in winter. And definitely temperatures below 18 degrees suppresses its searching. And our mouse virus is pretty much the same. Um, it's got a little bit of a higher optimal temperature. It's effective right up to almost 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and it has lower oviposition in winter. Um, so both of these are good because they can find hosts at low pest density, whereas um, Delphastis and the mites um, work a little better when there's already populations, like bigger populations of whitefly going on. So now we're going to talk about our mites. So Swirsky eye, um, we obviously are using it for thrips and white fly control, but it seems to work better when both of them are present at the same time. Um, it does feed on white fly eggs and first in star nymphs. And it's only effective um, when white fly populations are pretty low already. Um, whereas, like I said, Delphastis is, works better when there's a bigger white fly population. And this Swirsky eye was originally sourced from the Mediterranean, so it likes higher temperatures, so its optimal temperature is 25 and above. And so Lamonicus is a bit different. It also works for thrips and whitefly um, control. It's more predaceous than Swirsky eye, but it's also way more money. It's about five times as much. Um, it's also different from Swirsky eye that it can feed on whitefly eggs and all nymphal stages, which is interesting. And it's also good at low temperatures. It can be functional um, down to 13 degrees Celsius. So it's possible that it's a little better for heavier white flight issues and in the winter. Um, so Delphastis feeds on all stages of white fly, but as I mentioned before, particularly it's an egg predator and the nymphs, but it does feed on all. Um, it does avoid feeding on parasitized nymphs, which is always a good characteristic of a biocontrol agent. Um, they're pretty good little flyers. Um, they are less active in cooler months. But they can be a good strategy for greenhouse whitefly as well in cut flowers or tropical plants where higher whitefly numbers are tolerated because like I said, it seems to need that initial sort of higher whitefly population to get started and to actually reproduce. So I'm going to show you a bit of a grower case study um, on a tropical um, uh, showcasing what Lamonicus can do. So this was a grower who was having a problem with Bamesia whitefly, uh, unknown species. Um, there are up to five cryptic species within 
um, Bamesia tabathi, so we've talked about B and Q, there could be several other species in there. And um, Mike's fairly convinced there, there might be a third species that um, comes in on tropicals because he's noticed some of different um, behaviors and development and things like that. So um, we didn't get it DNA or anything, but it was Bamesia tabathi. The grower um, was growing Mandevilla. And uh, Mike, did you want to talk about the species at all? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but years ago, uh, uh, Graham and I worked, uh, Ray Murphy and I worked on uh, having, trying to draw Demetia out of crops using uh, trap plants. And one of those trap plants was uh, uh, tomato uh, plants. And uh, did very well at uh, drawing Reno's white fly out, but not Demetia. So in the last couple of years, uh, I decided to go back with the um, tomato plants. It was kind of a, it was a bit of a, uh, a mistake, I guess, and uh, and put some tomato plants out in a in a poinsettia crop, and the mesia was attracted to the tomato plant. So I went, how can that be? After you know, ten years or something, why why is it going? Why is it able to do that? So my theory was, and, and I, I proved it uh, the following year, was uh, that they were one of those brokers of hibiscus plants. And it, it did come in with uh, Benicia, so was able to go, uh, it, it wasn't born on poinsettia. So, um, so, but it mingled just perfectly with them, uh, probably bred, bred with them. And uh, but we were able to draw a certain amount of amicia out with the tomato plants after all those years. So I, I'm convinced that, and and that is to our advantage because it may be uh, easier to control um, than the poinsettia uh, benicia, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. If if nothing else, it just points to this is a, a more complicated story than we think, and it, it's always you know we're always still learning, you know. B and Q as a biotype and then figuring out they were actually species is like a fairly new revelation. And then there can there's still room for more revelations to be made that explain all this stuff. So that's why these constant observations are really important and observations that growers bring to us where they think something's being a bit weird is really important because this is how we figure this stuff out. And, and challenging old paradigms too, just like Mike said about oh, you know, trap plants don't work in poinsettia. Well, they don't work, you know, exactly like he said, if the, the, the Bamesia are born and raised on poinsettia, they don't want to move. But in other cases, it can work. So I think that's always important to keep coming back and, and, and challenging these assumptions that we've made for ourselves um, as things change and evolve. Um, so this grower had mandevilla, again, Bamesia species unknown. <laughs> He was already using Aramoceros and Swirskii at really, really high rates. So we're talking about with the wasps, he was using 75 wasps per meter squared, which is kind of crazy. And that like comparatively, like a poinsettia program would have like nine to 12 wasps per meter squared. And he really wasn't finding it effective over the winter, you know, when light levels are low and he's growing these plants around 16 to 20 degrees Celsius. He's also tried pesticides and he wasn't impressed with them for, um, uh, white fly control either. So Contos belief, it could be because, um, again, the lower temperatures when you're trying to use a drench of a systemic product um, that causes feeding cessation, um, maybe that just takes too long to translocate a plant into the bug. But for whatever reason was going on, he wasn't happy with his results using his current bio program or pesticides. So we decided to throw Lamonicus in there because like I said, it's been on the market for a while, but nobody's been really using it for anything. So I sort of felt like this will be the time if it was ever gonna do anything. So we set up a trial in a commercial greenhouse. You can see these huge blocks we used. So every um, two weeks we would go in and randomly sample 10 plants per treatment. Um, we had a whole bunch of replicates set up and we watched these from November to February. So over the exact period of time where you know his parasitoids weren't really working. And we compared Swirskii and Lamonicus head to head at high curative rates, so 150 mites per meter squared. 
And this is what we saw looking at counting adult and late instar of Bemisia. So basically the, the stages of Bemisia that you can see with like your naked eye to make counting easier. Um, so obviously the actual numbers were higher, but the um, average numbers we saw um, at the beginning of the trial, um, the grower got a little bit nervous and did a SOAP application. So we knocked back the Bemisia numbers but then you could see that in the Swirsky eye treatment, they just bounced right back. Whereas the Lamonicus treatment between um, December and uh, mid-January were able to keep the numbers suppressed. And then we also took samples from the new growth to actually count the eggs and, and first instars, because like I said, we weren't able to do that in the field. And you can see that, um, and like I mentioned before, white fly like to lay their eggs on the new growth. So that's where you find the younger instars. And if you look at the average numbers, you can see that there was a huge difference between um, Lamonicus and Swirsky eye on first instars and eggs as well. So Lamonicus did a much better job of suppressing them in cold temperatures. Although the caveat here, I feel like I needed to redo these numbers because this doesn't quite seem right, but the point is Lamonicus is expensive. I don't think it's quite this bad. Um, but obviously throughout his whole crop in that big area I showed you earlier, even though this worked, possibly not the most sustainable approach ever, but in his back pocket anyway for when white flies not looking good. So what we decided to do is exactly what Mike said. So this was Graham's idea was to take eggplants as a trap plant for the mandevilla once they moved to their other location. So these got moved to um, poop houses or cold frames that were ventilated but not heated um, in February. And they stayed there till they were sold in May. Um, so these ended up being highly successful in the mandevilla. So they pulled the Bemisia whitefly out of the crop and we also applied the bios to the eggplant. So we did Lamonicus starting February 1st. And then once the weather warmed up a little bit, in late March, early April, we started adding Delphastus as well. And we were able to keep this Mandevilla crop, crop basically spotless for three months. And the grower just did one final cleanup application of soap um, just to sort of like make himself feel better <laughs> at the end. Um, but using this strategy of the eggplant and adding the expensive bios to that and using it as both a trap plant and a baker plant significantly reduced his biocontrol costs um, but was really highly effective. So I think this would work in something like hibiscus as well. Um, at, for any sort of long-term crop that's going over the winter that um, is susceptible to white fly. So that was a success story. Um, so the overall outcome is that we found out that real, so I didn't show you previous data we did that showed really, really high rates of wasps just did not provide better control in the winter. Um, than using Lamonicus or Swirsky eyes. So like, it's one of those things where more doesn't equal better. Um, they just can't perform in the winter, Aramoceros or Encorsium. So Lamonicus did better than both the parasitic wasps and Swirsky eye in winter. And the grower was ultimately happy to invest in Lamonicus over the cooler months. Um, so the current treatment this grower is using in his mandevilla is he's dipping them at receipt to lower those initial white fly numbers um, he's dipping them in 1% soap. Uh, Mandevilla can take a little bit more um, uh, soap than a lot of other plants. And then he's using a combination of Aramoceros and Encartesia from March till October, and he's happy with that. And then in October, once the light levels and temperatures start to drop, he switches to Lamonicus plus Delphastis on trap plants, and then just relies on Cucumorus and Swirsky for thrips control only and not for his white fly control. And that's given him a successful program and also lowered his costs. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about Bemisia whitefly in poinsettia. So not unlike our thrips um, situation, in Ontario, we've, we've developed a pretty um, uh, robust program for Bemisia IPM um, in Ontario. Um, so this is sort of the infographic for that. And basically, um, it starts with dipping cuttings, then we initiate biocontrol right away. And if pesticides are needed, they're delayed. And I'll explain why that is. And then every year we sort of reevaluate. So which bios we're using, what rates, 
um, which pesticides worked last year, which do we think are going to work this year, depending on what's being done at the producer end. So um, the reason we're doing a lot of this, especially delaying pesticides, is because of resistance. So um, again, the Bamesia B type or meme, some products work, the Q type or Med1. We have currently no registered products that we can safely say work in Canada. And as I mentioned before, these look identical. They can only be differentiated with genetic testing, but like I said, it's a bit of an academic exercise considering both can become resistant to things fairly easily. And I think I showed you this um, table before just to demonstrate the situation in Canada. This are, these are products recommended for Bamesia white fly control and um, on the Michigan State's uh, website. And in Canada, you see that we've basically got none of these and the ones we do have, we just got registered and some are getting deregistered or we have resistance to. So it's always a fun guessing game, trying to figure out what's gonna work in any given year. So back to this delayed pesticide application, what does this get us? Why would we do this? Um, so it really comes down to this B versus Q. So every year when we get the poinsettia cuttings in, it's always a mix of B and Q, um, but the ratio changes depending on the year and what was done at the producer end. But usually it's something, you know, 50-50 is a safe bet every year. So under spray conditions, this favors the Q biotype because some of the B, again, I, shouldn't, I should be saying species, not biotype, but anyway, some of the Bs will die because some of their population will be susceptible to some of the chemicals, whereas we're basically not gonna kill any of the Qs. So we end up with more Q under spray conditions. So like I said, the ratio of B to Q varies every year. Spraying in the early part of the crop just promotes the Q type. But if you delay sprays by two to three generations, the Bs will take over. Well, why is that? It's because in, under non-spray conditions, when you've got 50, 50 BQ, um, Bamesia is actually a much better <laughs> mater. They're able to, like a girl Bamesia B species is able to be like, hey, you're a boy Bamesia B, we should mate and have children together. The Q females get very confused about which one they're supposed to mate with. So when you mate two species that aren't compatible with each other, you basically get a donkey. So there, you'd end up getting a whole bunch of sterile cues, but all your bees that have made it successfully continue to, to populate uh, their species. So that's why you get the under non-spray conditions, it goes back to bees. So um, they're better maters. They're just more fit unless you throw a pesticide at them. So this is why we say wait eight weeks to spray because it gets you through two generations of Bamesia B getting it on <laughs> and making more of themselves that will be susceptible to, pop to pesticides or more susceptible. All right, so I did say you should delay cuttings or delay pesticide applications and not spray at the beginning because it'll screw things up, except you should definitely dip your cuttings. That's the exception here. And again, we're using these softer chemicals like soaps and oils and um, entomopathogenic fungi that don't promote resistance. So it's not the same thing as applying a, um, a, a chemical insecticide in that sense. Um, so there's videos on greenhousecanada.com or greenhouseipm.org showing you how to dip properly because uh, coverage is really key. And growers in our area sort of do a couple of different things that, that Mike was sort of talking about before. So some growers will get in their poinsettia cuttings and wanna um, harden them up in the cooler for a little bit first, and then they dip and stick them. So um, for those, we recommend um, the rates that uh, uh, Vineland came up with, which is 0.5% soap and the label rate of Botanigard. Some growers want to dip their cuttings in water right away and then to sort of make them more turgid and then put them in storage and then stick. So if you're going to do it that way, you might want to lower the soap just to reduce the chance of phytotoxicity. And then some growers for logistical reasons, um, maybe they just can't 
get the manpower to dip and then stick at the same time. Uh, some are dipping rooted cuttings. And again, just turning them over, like Mike said, and trying to get just the foliage into them. And so I haven't seen that done with oil. I would be a little nervous, but 0.5% soap in botanical seems to work well um, two to three weeks after sticking. Um, just make sure to um, not get too much of the soap actually on the roots um, because that isn't great. So why do we dip? It reduces the starting population of whitefly. So here's data from the Vineland Research and Innovation Center, so um, Rose Bautenhaus's work. And you can see that if um, you just use parasitoids after week seven, your whitefly numbers have gone up quite a bit per plant. Um, if you use a dip, a dip alone, not even adding in bios, you're still in a better position, but your best position is if you dip and then add your bios, so parasitoids. So now we're gonna focus on the biocontrol part of this program. And it can be confusing as to what bios to pick and, and um, what rates you wanna use. So that's always a question. So we don't have one recipe yet, like we sort of do with thrips, but we've got three basic strategies. So the first is your standard parasitoid program that uses both Aramosaurus and Encarcia, and all your major biocontrol companies have that kind of program. Um, option two is a, what we call the West Coast program, and it was come up with by Applied Bionomics. And they are recommending only Encarcia, no Aramoceros, and Delphastis. And you'll notice that I've got the word fresh next to Encarcia, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then option three that some growers are doing is the kitchen sink approach, where they're doing Delphastis, Encarcia, Aramoceros, Swirsky, Lamonicus, some food in there for the mites, a whole array of things. So I won't talk about that one just because it's a little bit too hard to study, but for the other ones, I've got some head-to-head -head comparisons to show you. Just in terms of timing of bios, um, so parasitoids, you want to release right at potting if you can and continue weekly. You can even consider releasing them before then, so during misting. And if you do that, you just have to make sure to place the parasitoid release cards under styrofoam cups so that they don't mold before they are, um, can hatch out. Delphastis, however, you'll remember that slide I showed you with all the residues that come in on cuttings. Well, Delphastis is one of those canaries in the coal mine, so we need to wait a minimum of four weeks after sticking poinsettia cuttings to avoid pesticide residues issues, or you're just going to kill your Delphastis. So you want to apply them sort of like mid-August. All right. So back to this fresh Encarcia business. So what that means is just they've never been chilled. So the, the Aramoceros and Encarcia that come over from Europe obviously have to be chilled um, in the pupil stage to be stored, to be shipped over. Um, the ones that come from the West Coast here, and you can buy them in the States, they're sold through um, IPM labs in um, upstate New York. Um, they've never been chilled. So they basically turn into pupae, they get bottled right away, they get sent to you and they're starting to hatch out basically the, as soon as they get to you. So is there truth behind this fresh is better than frozen? I mean, I'm using the word frozen loosely, but um, uh, work done by Les Ship at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, um, as well as some other collaborators showed this is an actual thing. So if we look at flight capacity, um, there was different chilled treatments on this side with both Aramoceros and Encarcia. And fresh treatments, so just uh, a supplier versus a lab control on this side. And you can see for both Aramoceros and um, Encarcia in red and blue, uh, the flight capacity was much better when they were fresh. So there was decrease of almost 50% in their flight capacity when they were chilled. And uh, looking at another metric, um, parasitism. So you can see here, the different chilled treatments, whether it's from the supplier or they did a lab controlled trilled, chilled treatment, um, there was a huge decrease in parasitism rates versus fresh. And they measured a whole assortment of things. Um, but these are the two that I picked out to, to sort of convince you that fresh is better than frozen. Um, so we've been talking about biocontrol and delaying pesticide treatments. So how do we know this program that we've sort of been selling you works? Well, it's because we've been doing repeated on-farm trials at a large commercial operation for over five years now. 
And each treatment is in an individual compartment that has 10,000 plants. And we're doing mixes of reds and colors, we're monitoring the crop weekly, and we're also determining the cost per pot of our treatments every year. So we have a lot of data. I'm just gonna show you a few snapshots. Um, so here is an example of one year where we looked at this West Coast program, which had Delphastis and the Fresh Encarcia. We compared it to the standard parasitoid program for many of the, the biocontrol companies. So that's basically high rates of parasitoids. Um, with this fresh program, they're recommending much lower rates of Encarcia. It's 0.25 Encarcia per meter squared, where the standard parasitoid programs are more like nine wasps per meter squared. And then of course, we were comparing these to pesticide treatments. So how do we monitor this exactly? Are, are monitoring cards useful for white fly in this situation? And the answer is no. Uh, this was something um, uh, Graham and Mike worked on a really long time ago. Oh, and me, I forgot my name was on that. <laughs> uh, new publication, yay. Um, we figured out that the white fly on the plants don't translate to the white fly on the cards. So they are not, they're a good indicator, but they're not good to really understand how your program is, is going up and down in terms of pest levels. So how do we monitor them? So Graham and I have been working on this and we do presence absence sampling on whole plants every seven to 10 days between mid August and late October. Um, there's not really enough action going on that you can see before mid August. So um, once you've stuck your cuttings, you can sort of let them ride. Um, well, obviously applying bios, but you don't need to monitor them closely until mid-August. And our rule of thumb is we scout 5% of the crop every time. So in a compartment of 10,000 plants, what this looks like is 10 to 20 plants per bench. We put them up in the air, we spin them around, and we just say, do you have white fly? Yes, no. And that could be one adult, or it could be a leaf that's loaded. Um, we do sort of make notes of that. We, we sort of record whether it's onesies, twosies, which is just one or two, insects on there, or if it's loaded, we'll, we'll indicate that. And we record reds and colors separately because as most people know, the, col the colors like the whites and pinks seem to attract more white fly. So they're usually our problem areas and we don't wanna necessarily uh, mesh all the data together unless it makes sense. So then how do we figure out if our programs are successful or not, or our treatments, how do they measure up head to head? So we're looking at this uh, percent infestation. So we're using our presence absence data and just saying how much of the crop is infested. And the successful line is 20% infestation in mid-October. If you're at that point in mid-October, chances are by the time you get to sale in November, your white fly numbers will still be low enough that the consumer won't notice and you won't get credits. Um, it's not to say your crop's going to be perfectly clean, but it'll be saleable. Um, anything over that is a red flag that your numbers are going to go up too much. Um, and the reason this mid-October point is here is because at that point, just after that, you're turning down the temperature. Um, so your white fly numbers aren't going to increase as drastically as they would between August and October. So again, our, the, here's an example of, a pro, of treatments we tested. We've got our standard parasitoid program, our low encarcia, and Delphastis program, look at the difference in rates, and pesticides. And in this case, they did high label rates of contos and distance. And this was in 2017, which was generally a good white fly year, meaning that when the cuttings came in, there wasn't very much white fly seen. People were like, oh, I think things are gonna turn out well this year. And indeed they did. All of our treatments were well under this 20% cutoff in October, which is great. So then if we look at costs, Obviously, in this situation, the pesticide treatment is cheaper. Um, although even our low Encarcia um, Delphastis treatment uh, was relatively inex inexpensive compared to the standard parasitoid program. But this really ignores the elephant in the room of what happens in a bad white flyer. So some of you remember 2018, not too long ago. Um, suppliers were being pretty honest that they were having really high white fly numbers in their production. Um, there was a large list of chemicals they admitted to using and growers were noticing a high starting white fly number on cuttings. And we also had an unusually hot August that year, which didn't help. It sort of helped ramp things up. So in that year, 
our treatments turned out completely differently. So we had our standard parasitoid program, our Encarcia and Delfastis at low rates, and we tried a, an Encarcia only program even, as well because the Delfastis is the expensive part of the West Coast program. So we thought, what if we just try this fresh Encarcia on its own, but just like double the rate? And you can see that all three of the biocontrol programs were under our successful line and the pesticides were not. And in this case, cost per pot turns out very differently. So the cheapest one at three cents per pot was effective and is basically the same price as pesticides were in a low white fly year. But our pesticide treatment, they ended up trying application after application, trying to beat back these white fly, which could have been Q, but mine is, could have also just been resistant B. So they said bent 10 cents per pot on pesticides and had crop losses of almost 10%. So obviously if it doesn't work, then pesticides are not the way to go. So you may have seen this um, slide at the beginning when I was talking about uh, what IPM and floriculture is governed by. And I mentioned that it wasn't governed by efficacy or it wasn't governed, yeah, it wasn't governed by efficacy that rates and applications were governed by economics. And then on point study is 10 cents per pot was sort of the max people were willing to spend. Well, I think we need to amend that to 10 cents per pot and reliable. So nobody, you know, in a perfect world, you would two cents per pot sounds great, but if it's not reliable, then that's technically a failed program. So a much better option is to spend somewhere from three to 12 cents per pot and know your program's going to work. Oops, hit something. All right, sorry. We're gonna have to watch the time, uh, Sarah. Sorry? We're gonna have to watch the time. We're, we're um, nine minutes to three, so. Oh, geez, okay. Uh, yeah, so we're at, we're at the take home messages. So biocontrol can be more expensive, but it consistently works. Um, successful biocontrol can be cost competitive with pesticides. <clears throat> Cheaper biocontrol programs likely require a little bit more of a watchful eye though, that Encarcia only one. Kind of, we've done it a couple years in a row and it kind of squeaks close to that 20% line sometimes. Um, but even using biocontrol to delay pesticide sprays is a better approach because it prevents that Q species from taking over. So it's like buying insurance for your pesticides. And the last thing I've got is just the on floriculture blog. Um, I've got, um, uh, going over those sort of um, critical cutoff points and how to scout. I've got posts on that. And lastly, um, if you want a bit more in depth uh, talk on this, I did a talk for Michigan State um, Extension Bug Bites and the link is there and I'll put that in the chat.